Hello there and welcome to the Gitex Tech Waves podcast. Now I'm delighted to say that joining me in our studio today is a really fantastic guest. I'm hugely excited to have Dr. Diane Janasek here join us. Now, amongst many roles, uh, Diane is the CEO of Janos LLC. She's also uh, served in key positions in the Pentagon, uh, also the White House and the National Security Agency in the United States. Um, you've also been nominated as US Role Model of the Year and Cybersecurity Woman Leader of the Year for 2024. So it's a great privilege to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much, Georgia. Thank you for your time. Now, I, I know that you have a real focus on uh, critical infrastructure. Can I ask you to describe how, what, what you would consider critical infrastructure first? Critical infrastructure in the United States is uh, characterized as 16 different sectors. And I can tell you what those are, but the reason why they're considered critical is because they're the underpinning of the entire, entire economy and the livelihood of the United States. So anything that, com that truly is the, the foundation upon which our liberties uh, reside. What we've looked at, what we've known now in the United States is that 80% of that foundation, the digital infrastructure foundation, is owned by the private sector. It's not owned by the government. So even if the government was to issue an edict that all of the infrastructure was secure, it's, it's only good enough, 20% is not, so, you know, you're going to fail. So what has, as a result, uh, they've said, you know, we're gonna look at these 16 sectors, that is like transportation, energy, manufacturing, uh, telecommunications, uh, finance. So there's 16 of them and, and across the United States. And so across those, they've said, you know, we have to really focus on building up resiliency within the critical infrastructure because the government can't do it alone. We need the private sector, we need academia, we need research and the government to come together to shore up critical infrastructure because that really is the first area of vulnerability mm -hmm. where Americans, uh, in, in any, any country, um, its citizens would be concerned when the hospital system's infrastructure goes down or you can't get gas because the pipelines have gone down or you can't purchase something because all of the internet communications have gone down. So it just creates a fragility, there's fragility in the network if we don't shore it up. What are the and what are some of the most significant threats, you know, facing that critical infrastructure in terms of cyber security? Well, what we've seen in the last two years, and most likely it will continue, is there has been significant increase of ransomware on the critical infrastructure sectors. For example, with the hospitals, there's been healthcare systems, um, the energy sector and water sector. You can imagine, you know, your everyday life, right? You can't get the health care that you need if you're going in for surgery. Um, your water, if you cannot drink it or you can't have the energy access in your house. All of those would be very unnerving, right? Very unnerving to, um, to you as just your daily livelihood. And it would cause you to lose confidence in your government and its ability to govern. So you'd have to, so what they've been asking for is people to pay attention you know, make cybersecurity everyone's responsibility and really understand that we're so interconnected that we need to protect each other to all rise. The magnitude of the, uh, the situation that you face is almost sort of incomprehensible. You're dealing with so many potential weak leaks. I mean, uh, links. I mean, ultimately, every single individual that works for a hospital or works for a nuclear power station or a and a factory has the potential to, to bring that down if they let in malware, for example. So how, on, uh, how do you start? <laughs> well, I think education and awareness, uh, I think it's good and bad, you know, because of the proliferation of so many uh, ransomware attacks and um, cyber attacks and hacks and people just having, their, having to replace their credit card because it was compromised. People are now aware, oh my goodness, this is real. So, so we, we don't have to do an awareness campaign because now people are, are aware because it's happening to them, it's happening to their neighbors, it might be happening to their mother or their father in terms of a, of, a, of a fraudulent activity on their account. So the awareness is there. So the next step is really education. And the education is we all have a role. For example, I grew up in Canada and one of the things that we learned was um, to turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth. And I, I remember learning that and they repeated it a couple of times and now you know, I learned it for myself. So, and that was back in kindergarten. So we really have to start at that, that young age now where they're on the tablets, learn at an early age to lock your computer up, understand what's going on and just 
make it an awareness across all ages um, and and make it less scary as well. Like saying, you know, we've got this, you have, you can, you, we can do this together. Yeah, we don't want the weakest link to take us down, but together we'll, be to, we'll move forward. How about at an organizational level? You know, how can businesses, how can companies strengthen their cybersecurity position? So having trusted circles, um, a trusted um, supply chain, having integrity in your supply chain, having visibility into your supply chain. Uh, we've seen about 60% of the vulnerabilities and the attacks are in the supply chain. And typically that's because usually the company doesn't have visibility into the supply chain. It doesn't always know the history of all the components, software and hardware that it's receiving. So because of the lack of visibility into the supply chain, it can't necessarily protect itself. So one of the things that companies are now trying to do is understanding um, the software bill of materials. They have to understand um, who their partners are, what components are going into those products, and train their employees to ask the questions. And it's okay to ask. It's, it's okay to say, explain to me what we have here. Where did that come from? Uh, what type of software did you use? What open source materials did you use as you, you know, maybe may have um, entered into this, into the product line so that you have some awareness so you can protect. I guess there must be an increased focus now on hardware as, yes. as well as software, considering the circumstances we've seen yes. just recently. I imagine that is making everyone hyper aware of, of the circumstances of what they've got in their factories or their hospitals. Yeah. So for a while there, you were hearing that we don't have a cybersecurity problem, we have a, a software security problem, and the software is not secure. So now with the hardware, I mean, hardware has always been, a, there's always been an opportunity to compromise with access if you have with hardware. So now it's just once again, that awareness campaign, it's now everyone on everyone's radar. Uh, so people are more aware of it. The, the, uh, the harm has always been there, but it has not been, it has not been so obvious to so many people as it is now, unfortunately. We're seeing a huge shift towards digitization in every single sector and ultimately that does seem to be the goal of course that makes the cyber security situation ever evolving um how do you see that progressing i suppose as the world becomes more digitized and more interconnected do you think that the cyber security world can keep up with the threats it's interesting that you ask about the digitization so i was just on a panel a little earlier with dr al kuwaiti uh, for the Cybersecurity Council here in the UAE, as well as the head of cyber for Malaysia. And Malaysia is really excited because they introduced uh, you know, digital, and digital identity, and that was really exciting for their country. So the challenge, of course, is that as companies move into the digital era, there's an uh, open aperture for vulnerability, unfortunately, right? Because the um, one-stop shop, so to speak, a hacker could gain access to all the crown jewels in a much easier way um, if all that information is co-located in a certain location. That happened in the United States um, with the Office of Personal Management. All of the personnel records of the U.S. government's, federal government's uh, personnel records were hacked into and stolen about a decade or so ago. And it was because of that, one-stop shop. It's all located in one, you know, one hard target. You break through that and you get it all. So the crown jewels are ready and available. So. Uh, that's the only concern with digitization is it increases efficiency, but you have to have efficiency measured with security. Who are the bad actors in these types of situations? Are we talking about, I don't know, like kids in their bedrooms trying to get into the government bodies because it's kind of fun and they're rebellious? Or, or are we talking about, you know, state actors, state bad actors? That is a terrific question. So the, uh, we talked earlier today about a cyber crime, and I think the cyber crime, um, cyber terrorism, and cyber welfare, and the motivations and for those different ones are all slightly different. So the cyber crime, usually they're, it's perpetuated, usually for financial gain. Um, it could be to harm a, harm a competitor, um, but usually for financial gain is a cyber crime, and that could be where the you know, someone in their bedroom is just having fun and just the joy of it, or, you know, just the, you know, the reputation, like, hey, look what I did. And then you go into the cyber terrorism where uh, it's used as a tool to create uh, dissonance within a country, um, to influence in ways that uh, may not be, may not have been desired by the, by the current, by the current um, leadership of a particular country. So a cyber criminal or a cyber terrorist is trying to um, sow uh, you know, uh, ill seed, so to speak, 
And then when you go into the cyber welfare, that is where the questions of intent um, are a little more sketchy, a little more unknown, because if you were going to impact a hospital without, you didn't really care about the money. You were just wanted to disrupt it on such a large scale or the whole, an entire grid, electrical grid, you know, one quadrant of the United States, for example. That would be for a whole nother reason. You know, that would be to really take, uh, cause people to have pause um, in terms of what's going on in the country and where things are going. And it really would create some level of fear, right? And so at the end of the day, we have to have secure, um, a secure lifestyle and have welfare. We need to be humans, right? We need to be able to go to the grocery store, go to the hospital, um, take our car, get gas in it. We need to be able to travel on, on, an air, on an airline and not be impacted by a cyber software update that caused the whole airline to go down. So just our basic livelihood as humans is now being interrupted by cyber attacks. And to me, that just raises the the whole paradigm has changed. Mm. Like our, own, our whole livelihood is almost dependent upon this digitization of our world. And it's a little bit unnerving for some, you know, and for others, it might be kind of fun because it's a challenge. But at the end of the day, um, we have tremendous um, dedicated professionals that are committed to cybersecurity, committed to protecting humanity, and just, you know, working every day to, you know, make it more secure. So I have hope. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you have hope because I have to say from, from the other side where, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm behind the scenes on this, so to speak, I'm learning about it. But, but the reality for me it seems that there's just too many gaps. There's too many possibilities for these bad access to permeate, you know, through. And, and I just wonder whether it is even possible to keep up with them. But, you know, is there a scenario where you know, you can have total security because that's what you want at a hospital, right? That's what you want at a nuclear power plant. So you are right. The um, cybersecurity gaps exist at the seams. Uh, you know, we're a collaborative, but we're not integrated. So when you don't have full integration, you're going to have the seams not connect directly connecting and they're not um, you know, overlapping and knitted together. Mm -hmm. And it's when they're not knitted together closely is where there'll be the fractures and the opportunities for cyber attacks. And we're definitely seeing that. So I'm glad you, you, know, you mentioned that. But um, so one of the options of going moving forward is the zero trust architecture where you know exactly who you're partnering with, trust but verify as Ronald Reagan would say. I'm um, really understanding who you're partnering with, having a trusted ecosystem. And as you, uh, you know, you develop a, you know, a small cohort of your you know, trusted partners and you slowly let others in and develop that over time with confidence so that you can proceed with confidence and with some level of assurance that we all have the same values in mind and the same desire to prosper as well as to be secure. So my final question, you know, are there innovations coming through that you find promising, that you find exciting, that could potentially, you know, improve our protection of critical infrastructure? I don't necessarily think it's technical innovation, although that's going on right now. Um, but I think what the improvements are that will be making a difference is increased international awareness for multinational uh, partnerships. We have to, as, a, as countries, find where we can come together, common values, common platforms, maybe common sectors and across certain sectors, for example, even just for the water sector, for example, come together and be able to share cyber threat intelligence information, share what we're seeing in terms of trends, see share what we're seeing in terms of maybe which nation states or what geographic area the criminals are coming from, where they're operating from. We've also seen, for example, criminals uh, renting infrastructure for 30 days and then you know, changing out and getting another one for just lack of traceability. So we have to work together uh, just to combat that because it's just too much to keep up with. So I really have great faith in international collaboration and cooperation um, in cybersecurity. I think it's, 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 it's right now we're on the verge of it and I think it's just going to exponentially grow. I have to say it's lovely because I know you've been on stage and I know you're about to go on stage again and you are part of this mix of, of you know bringing different nations together to have these types of conversations. So and I know you're an incredibly busy person. So thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon right here on the Jitex Tech Waves podcast. Uh, Dr. Diana Janosek, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you.
So thank you so much there to Dr. Diane Janicek for your time in the studio. And so if you want to find out more about Dr. Diane Janicek, or if you want to get in touch with her, if you want to be part of that relationship building scenario, then please do check out her website, which is dianejanicek.com. And for more fantastic interviews like that, please do stay tuned to the Jitex Tech Waves podcast. You can subscribe. And if you want to find out more details, please do check out our social media at Jitex Global. Thank you very much.